this will be recorded. It will be it will be made available online on our website and searchable. Um, if you do not want to disclose any information, uh, you can uh, hide your name. You can uh, turn your screen off. Um, but this will be made <clears throat> available. Remember, this is not medical advice. This is uh, a, a learning opportunity uh, for our patients. And uh, if you seek uh, medical advice, please contact your, uh, your physician for that. And so with that, I am happy to announce that uh, Dr. Rossi is here uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Rossi, uh, I, I just met with him last week, I think on Thursday or Friday, uh, regarding my own case and the use of proton therapy in my particular um, disease setting. Uh, Dr. Rossi is an expert in proton therapy uh, and all matters related to uh, radiation oncology, I would say. Um, I valued his counsel, not only on radiation, but just on how to navigate um, some of the challenges that I've had with, uh, with, with my disease uh, in a broader sense. Um, Dr. Rossi uh, came from Loma Linda University Medical Center, which is where really, I believe, proton therapy was invented, I think back in the 70s, if, if memory serves me correctly. Um, and he mentored for him one of the best. And so, Dr. Rossi, maybe I'll have you. I'm ad living here a little bit uh, based, upon, <laughs> based upon my, my own experience with you. Uh, if you want to uh, um, add some more context, I think it would be helpful. Uh, sure, but before absolutely. you do that, you know, I, I think that the main point for our patients is that when they're considering local therapy, it's often just a decision between doing surgery or radiation. And I think what Dr. Rossi is going to help us understand is when does that make sense? And what is the difference between proton therapy and various other forms of local radiation? And so with that, Dr. Rossi, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for the introduction, Brian. Yeah, um, and I, I got into all this entirely by accident. I just happened to do my radiation oncology residency at Loma Linda when they were starting construction of what, is, what was and is the world's first medical proton center. So I was there you know, again, by accident when everything, when everything kind of was got going at that place and ended up staying there for almost 25 years afterward, <laughs> and then came down here when this facility was being built because the technology differences, uh, at, which are true now of all the newer centers. And I'll be touching on that again in, in this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and do the screen share. Um, you should be able to see uh, slide per slide, I hope. Is that Yes, awesome? we've got it. Excellent. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, this is it's going to be uh, there's a fair number of slides. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, though, just because I want I know I want to save a lot of time for Q&A. And I'm going to talk about the use of protons near the end, both in primary therapy. It's one of the many ways to cure prostate cancer that's localized. And also in uh, what we're doing more and more of now, which is treatment of oligometastatic disease. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that's because we're becoming somewhat not victims, but it's a consequence of our success at controlling prostate cancer and other cancers. This, this idea of treating solitary metastasis or a few metastasis has really come about because the primary therapies and the systemic therapies have gotten better and that people live long enough to develop these problems. That wasn't as much of an issue even 10, 15 years ago. So it's, you know, it's in some respects, it's a good problem to have until we get to the point that we can eliminate this stuff, you know, be this stuff being radiotherapy and current therapies entirely. Let's see if I can get this to actually move. So just to remind folks, the target for radiotherapy is DNA. You know, that's what we do with any type of radiation. What we're doing is we're causing DNA breaks. And the idea is that you create enough breaks to overwhelm the cell's ability to repair that damage. So the cell dies and attempts to replicate. Normal tissue is somewhat better at repairing this versus malignant tissue, but that difference is often not that great. And that's why when you talk about radiotherapy, we've done a lot of things to try to be more specific because the more dose we can put in the bad stuff, the greater we can crack that window open of, of repair difference between bad tissue and good tissue. And we've had radiotherapy for a really long time now. It's been over well over 100 years. Uh, it actually was first used in a very rudimentary way before the beginning of the 20th century. So within a year of the discovery of x-rays and natural radioactivity, people were using it to treat all sorts of stuff. 
And they learned a lot of things the hard way. This is this background picture is a monument in that forget which city in Germany, but it's to the radium martyrs, these several hundred people, clinicians, other folks who died because of radiation-induced diseases they developed, you know, stuff that we, again, we learn the hard way, like so many things in, in medicine and in science. So we have some basic tenets in radiotherapy. You know, the first is that nothing that we know of is radiation resistant. Some things are more resistant than others, but if you give a high enough dose, you can kill anything with radiation, anything that we know of. In general, the malignant cells, as I mentioned a minute ago, are less able to repair that damage, but that difference can be relatively modest. And the other is this idea that, hey, you know, we, we have understood now, again, learned empirically, radiation is a toxin and that there probably is no dose below which toxicity does not occur. Now, certainly the higher doses are more toxic, but that doesn't mean that lower doses are non-toxic. We have this concept that's called ALERA, which means as low as reasonably achievable. It underlies all radiation protection, whether you're working in a nuclear power plant or whether you're doing radiation therapy or diagnostic work. We try to keep the dose to people as low as we can. And this is underlying all of our modern radiotherapy delivery technologies, this desire to spare people from unnecessary radiation. And we got a lot of advances. You know, we have intensity modulated x-ray therapy, IMRT, which is probably the standard way of doing x-ray therapy. We have protons, we have brachytherapy or implants, we have radioimmunotherapy, as many of you have experienced you personally. And these are all different variations on the same theme. That is, let's limit toxicity by being as careful as we can and using whatever technology we have to maximize target dose and minimize normal tissue dose. And the reason we all pull on the physics lever is because we understand it better, okay? We do not have as nearly as accurate a grasp of the radiation biology, despite having studied this now for a long time, as we do on radiation physics. So we use the tool that we can exploit and that's the physics tool. And you know that size is actually a duplicate, so I can skip on that. So I mentioned a minute ago that IMRT is the standard you know, radiation tool. And what you do with IMRT is you're using different x-rays, either in a what's called a step and shoot fashion or an arc, where you're doing a volumetric arc. And you're varying the intensity of the beam as you deliver it so that you're stacking the dose, the highest dose in whatever target you want to hit. And that works just great. Compared to three-dimensional x-ray therapy of 10, 15, 20 years ago, this is much better. But the problem is you're using x-ray beams and you have dose on the way in and dose on the way out. So the compromise you have to make if you're doing, say, IMRT uh, to the prostate is that to get that beautiful high dose of depth, you're going to give a bath of dose to everything else. And when we talk about this bath, what people will say, well, it's low dose. You got to put that in context. You know, you may be giving 8,000 rad to the prostate and 3,000 rad to the intestine. That's not low dose. You know, that's, that's a very high dose to normal tissue. But with when you're using x-rays, this is what you're stuck with from the physics side because you can't make the x-ray beam stop at a point in space. And this is where protons come in. So protons, again, review, they're part of every atomic nucleus. They have a positive charge. The number of protons in the nucleus determines the physical properties of the element. And what all this means is that if you shoot them into things, that they're ionization, the radiation effect that they give is not like that x-ray beam where it goes all the way from you know, one end to the other. You have a point in space where the particle is coming to a stop where you get this spike of ionization and then the dose drops to zero afterward because the particle has come to rest. And this was discovered by William Henry Bragg, a Nobel Prize winning physicist of the early 20th century, he discovered this back in 1904. But it wasn't until some 40 plus years later that somebody said, hey, you know, there may actually be a practical use for this phenomena. And this person in question, Robert R. Wilson, a uh, fascinating man, youngest section head at Los Alamos during World War II, uh, did all sorts of other exciting, interesting things in his career. But in July of 1946, he wrote a paper, published a paper called Radiological Use of Fast Protons, in which he said, hey, you know, Perhaps if we could figure out how to stop these particles in a target, like a, in his case, it was a brain tumor example, we could deliver radiation at depth without having to treat nearly as much normal tissue. 
And like most things in science, the concept occurs before you can actually do it. Although in the mid 1950s, which is the left-hand picture, actually 1954, people first started trying this at the Harvard Cyclotron Lab at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And needless to say, they were using setups that are a little different than what we have today. It was just a, a beam coming out of the accelerator that the person on the left had a, a tumor of the head and neck they were trying to treat. What you have in the right is a picture from April 1988. This is the groundbreaking at Loma Linda of the world's first medical proton center, which went in operation in 1990. And most centers, at least up until relatively recently, are designed like this is a schematic of our facility here in San Diego, where you have a cyclotron, some type of particle accelerator. We use a cyclotron. You can use a synchrotron. It doesn't matter. And that one machine serves many rooms, the majority of which have isocentric gantries so you can treat from any angle. These were big, expensive units to construct, you know, big physical footprint, among other things, the back to that. But what's happening now, um, in fact, the UPenn has done this, among others, is the manufacturers have developed ways to make these a lot smaller. So what you have on the right is a one-room version of the building I'm sitting in, and it fits into a tennis court. And it costs about one-tenth of what this building did, because if most things in technology, and, you know, the more you build, the more companies that get into the market space, the more innovation there is. So this is what's making proton therapy much more accessible. The fact that you don't need $200 million and a big old piece of land to build it. You can put this in a much smaller footprint. All of the newer centers, this one, the one I'm sitting in included, we use electromagnetically scanned beams to treat our targets. So rather than shaping the beam with a mechanical device like we did at Loma Linda, we actually shape it electromagnetically, which means you can be very, very, very creative. Effectively, it's a 3D printer. You're painting dose and layers a millimeter thick through your target. So you can put high doses in some spots, lower doses in other spots. That's going to be important a few slides down the line when I talk about intraprostatic boosting. And it lets you change these plans quickly too. So if I have to change a plan, I can do it in 24 now in 24 hours, whereas that used to be a one plus week evolution at Loma Linda to actually make new devices and all this other stuff. We can just change the data file based upon new imaging. So currently we have over 40 facilities in the US that are operating. Um, there are a number of existing centers that are expanding. I mentioned UPenn earlier, uh, Mayo Clinic is expanding, University of Florida, MD Anderson, et cetera. Everybody who can, ha can have pencil beam scanning is doing it. There are about 18 facilities under construction at the moment, most of which are these one, two room smaller centers. So the, all this means the access is gonna get to be easier. They're not evenly distributed, of course. Most of the proton facilities are located at the major, at the in the Midwest and East at the M big NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers like UPenn, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, et cetera, et cetera. We still have a, somewhat of a dearth of them here out West that's slowly changing. Um, along with this, of course, you need to be able to hit what you're aiming at. You can have all the precision in the world that you want. doesn't matter if you, you don't have a good idea of the target. And this it, in prostate and other cancers goes to the importance of multimodality imaging, where you're not just doing CT scans, you know, you're doing actually a CT and MR and, and, and PET. So this is your typical CT scan of the pelvis, you know, with the prostate there in the center and the rectum behind it bladder in front of it. That This was what most people use to do planning. Uh, so a lot of people still use the do planning. It works. But where in the prostate is the cancer? If you want to hit something harder, you have no idea. But if you have an MRI that you can throw on there with the same patient, you can see on the left hand, it's actually the, the right hand side of the prostate, left hand side of the screen, that little dark circle, that is the dominant tumor in the peripheral zone. So now you can target that. I got the arrow pointing at it. And this is it using a different MR weighting sequence that, that, to, to confirm that that's the answer, that that's the area you want to treat. And that means if you can see it, you can tell the computer, put more dose there. And that's exactly what you do. And this is an example of using two proton beams to cover that area. In this case, the prostate, that region was getting about 14, 15% more than the rest of the gland. We actually go to higher doses now than that. And this is looking at the same patient cut laterally. And it, this illustrates... The difference, if you think back to those, a picture I showed you by MRT, where you had dose from skin to skin, you know, here you can see the dose is concentrated in the prostate. Once you get beyond the edge of this blue, this blue color wash, the dose is zero. So you're not treating intestines, you're not treating as much of the bladder, 
you're not treating rectum, you're not treating bone marrow. Uh, I don't have to tell this group about this, <laughs> but the F18, the, the, the PYL, just for diagnostic purposes, one of the things I was pleasantly surprised by was how quickly Medicare jumped on the bandwagon after the FDA approved it. And we've been doing these scans here as, as soon as we could. And we do them you know, more and more of them all the time because they're fantastic, not only for workup, they're fantastic for targeting. So you want to target pelvic lymph nodes in an oligometastatic case? You want to boost a lymph node? Here you go. Here's your target you want to boost. That lymph node under standard CT imaging would look normal. But with the taking up the PYL, it's telling you, okay, there's active disease there. You want to hit it harder. Um, example of a couple of treatment plans with comparing, say, IM, uh, IMPT proton therapy to the same patient being treated with VMAP, same target. In this case, we're treating the prostate and pelvic lymph nodes. Dose to target is exactly the same no different, which means the disease response is going to be the same. The difference is this dose bath, all this tissue you see on the right in that blue area, which is not being treated in the proton plan. And that's perhaps better illustrated when you look at the, the midline sagittal cuts here down in the bottom, where you, the x-rays are going here, there, and everywhere, covering the whole bladder, covering the vertebral bodies, et cetera, with protons. You don't have to do that. So some recently published data on treating intact prostate you know, first, we'll talk about some longer term stuff. This is going back really over a decade, if not more, University of Florida's Proton Center, where they were comparing their proton patients to those they treated at the same institution with IMRT, basically same radiation doses, slightly higher with protons. Um, they used hormonal therapy in both groups. The follow-up was pretty similar. What they found, first of all, is that they didn't see any difference in overall survival. Are you alive or not? Between, between proton therapy and, and IMRT, especially if the patients were older, but they did see a difference, which was not was there, it wasn't huge, but it was there in patients with low and intermediate risk disease, where there were a couple percentage point improvement in overall survival favoring the proton patients, likely because of better local control and not having other problems related to radiotherapy. They also saw that there was a reduction in significant toxicities both uh, GI, which are primarily rectal injury, and GU, which were bladder function, uh, favoring low, low in either group, favoring the proton patients. And that was their conclusion, was that despite the fact that they were giving higher doses in this group to pro proton patients, they were seeing that they had a lower toxicity rate and that they had a higher freedom from biochemical recurrence. Uh, and they were able to do this without having to use hormonal therapy for as long a time span, which is certainly good. The folks at Northwestern, which also has a proton center, did a, a big Medicare database mining thing, which we all kind of have mixed feelings about sometimes, but they were looking at IMRT prostate cancer patients and proton prostate cancer patients, and they saw that, again, there was a difference in overall survival favoring the proton patients, and this difference was primarily because of the increased incidence of secondary cancers in the x-ray therapy patients which you're going to hear more about in this a few slides down the road too. But that was the difference, that, that, that when you looked at why the IMRT patients were more likely to pass away, it's because they were more likely to develop either a solid tumor in the pelvis or leukemia because more of them was being treated. You know, you, the, you're splashing that x-ray dose here, there, and everywhere. You're treating more normal tissue, and therefore you're more likely to induce a radiation. Uh, it created cancer. Another publication, this came out of a big registry study. I'm, I'm one of the authors on this one where we are looking, same kind of comparison. And what we found is that if you have to treat the pelvis, you know, in, in prostate cancer, you do that in some cases, more advanced disease. We created a lot less toxicity using protons to treat the pelvis than IMRT because you weren't treating the intestine because we're not exiting through the intestine. And this is not to say IMRT is bad, it's really good treatment, but it just shows that the, you know, once again, if you don't treat a tissue, if I don't hit the intestine, I'm not gonna hurt it, I'm not gonna affect it. Um, second cancers, again, as I mentioned, I was gonna talk a little more about this. This was a very interesting paper that came out uh, about three years ago, published in Cancer, where the authors were looking at patients who had, for the 10 most common adult cancers, not just prostate cancer, where they were treated with 3D conformal x-ray therapy, which was the standard of the 90s and early 2000s, 
or IMRT, which is the standard today, or protons, did they see a difference? And they looked at like 70% of all the cancer patients in the country using this database. And they had lots and lots of patients to review. Uh, so pretty good sized data set. There are always problems with the bigger reviews, but still, you know, you're looking at lots and lots of patients. So you can probably draw some pretty good, at least broad brush conclusions. And what they found was that, first of all, when they compared the different types of x-ray therapy, they didn't see a difference in second cancer rate, which surprised a lot of us because if anything with IMRT, you expect it to be a little bit higher because you're bathing all that tissue to a greater extent in 3D conformal. But what they did find is that in the proton patients, the incidence of second cancers was, was less than one third the rate that was seen with either type of x-ray therapy. And they saw that in nine of the 10 adult malignancies. They didn't see it in the lung cancer patients, probably because the survival was pretty short, but it was consistent across all the age groups. And it was significant for getting all these different sites except for lung cancer. Not a surprise. We have mathematical models that are used for radiation protection, the ones that are, that are used as part of this whole ALERA you know, principle I mentioned earlier that predicted this, but it's, it's always good, of course, you know, to verify your model with real human data. You think back to the pandemic, we had lots of really scary mathematical models that thankfully just didn't come true. So one of the reasons this study was so important, primarily the size, the methodology, you know, there was, it wasn't done by people who work in the proton world, it was done out of Stanford. Again, it was consistent with this other modeling data. Since surprise, surprise, reducing normal tissue dose can help. Um, you know, so it had a lot of things going for it, and it really does support the idea of not treating healthy tissue if you don't have to do it. Now, the overall absolute, you know, rate of second cancers is low. Again, it doesn't mean that everybody you treat with x-rays gets a second cancer. It's around one or two percent in adults, but we use lots of radiotherapy and treat lots of people. So those small numbers do become important when you apply them to several hundred thousand people here in the United States. So what else do we have recently? Well, there's a lot of interest in this idea of doing intraprostatic boosting. Let's hit the cancer in the prostate higher. Now, let's put a higher dose in that area that's malignant. So there's this trial called the FLAME trial where they were actually looking at this in a randomized fashion. So half the patients got 77 gray, pretty good dose for the entire prostate. The other half got the same dose to the entire prostate, but then had a boost that was given simultaneously where they were giving up to 95 gray to whatever tumor they could identify. These results were reported out a couple of years ago, and here's what they found. They found that the disease-free survival, that's what this BDSF is, was about 7% higher in those patients who got the boost within the prostate versus those who didn't. Um, they did see a slight difference in toxicity between the groups, but it was small and it was not statistically significant. So it really supports the idea of doing what we've all do now. And that is, if you can identify a target, which means your imaging is showing you something, you want to hit it harder. And this is just giving you an idea. You know, again, these, these curves separate. Um, it, what they found is that this curve on the left is looking at the impact of you know a dose on survival, showing that the focal boost, the red line, patients had a higher survival over time. And also they found, not surprisingly, that if you control the disease locally, you get a decreased risk of distant failure. And that's what they're seeing here. So if you have a un locally uncontrolled cancer, it throws off, it's more likely to throw off metastasis, which is why we try to control local disease the best extent we can. Um, more of the same thing, you know, they were looking at patterns of failure. And what they said again was that we saw this clear dose response relationship. The higher the dose you could give to the intraprostatic lesion, the lower the probability of either distant local failure or distant failure. Doesn't come as a surprise. This is what all of our radiobiology predicts, but it's, again, it's always good to verify this in real live human beings. What about oligometastatic prostate cancer? I mean, last couple slides here. Um, as our technology has improved to identify this and as our ability to control systemic disease has also improved, this has become more of an issue, uh, particularly because many of these patients have had prior treatment to some of these sites where they're having recurrence. So like so many things in medicine, it's an evolving story. 
Uh, there are lots of different definitions that you'll see of oligometastatic disease. I mean, in general, it's five or fewer sites outside the primary tumor. So a prostate cancer would say free lymph node metastasis would be considered oligometastatic. And the, uh, this idea of treating these areas aggressively is predicated upon the concept that if you can ablate all the known disease, you may have a chance of curing the patient. And that's, you do see it, you know, 25, 30% of the time. But the very least what you do is you delay further progression, which improves quality of life because among other things, it allows you to stay off hormonal therapy uh, for which we all know it does not do wonderful things for holiday, you know, for quality of life. And this, like so many things in medicine, is not a new idea. You can go back and look in the literature, you know, 80 plus years ago, reports of uh, this, this one in particular, rectal cancer patient, solitary lung metastasis, had surgery and lived another 20 years without any sign of recurrence. And somehow that got lost in the 80s and 90s when I was a resident and even, you know, which years I was an attending, Oh, if you've got one side of METs, you, you're going to have them all over the place. So we're not going to bother doing local therapy. Well, you know, thankfully, people have revisited that and found that there is a rationale to do it. And there are a bunch of trials that have looked at this. Uh, this one that got a lot of press a few years ago was called Saber Comet. And half of having a good trial is having a really cool name you know, for it. You have something that's, that's catchy. What this was was a randomized study of standard of care, which was hormonal therapy, versus standard of care and using uh, stereotactic radiotherapy to ablate one of the five oligometastatic sites. And they did this in multiple histologies, not just prostate cancer. The most common ones were prostate, breast, lung, and colon. And what they saw for benefits, first of all, there were a lot. Uh, patients who were treated aggressively had a longer median overall survival. So their median survival was 50 months versus 28. They had a better five-year overall survival and a better progression-free survival. So it's win, 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 right? There was another trial that looked at this just in prostate, same thing, fewer, five or fewer metastatic sites, randomized after two months of hormone therapy to staying on hormone therapy alone or combining the hormone therapy with, with SBRT to the sites of disease. And then you stop the hormone therapy at six months and watch. And what they found, pretty much, first of all, the groups were well, you know, well evenly split. The patients receiving hormonal therapy alone had progression with biochemical progression with a median time of 15 months versus when this was published, the median had not yet been reached in the arm treated with hormone therapy plus focal radiotherapy. And also, not surprisingly, the uh, time for normal testosterone levels, you know, they re re recur to progression was improved by that combination. So what you found was that in the hormonal therapy alone arm, when you stopped it, if the patients had normal testosterone levels, they progressed within six months. If they had received this combination therapy, they hadn't reached that median time to progression yet. So you're knocking their disease down while they're in, and letting them have normal serum testosterone for quality of life. And that was their conclusion was that you get excellent local disease control and this, you facilitate uh, prolonged normal serum testosterone, so prolonged, relatively normal quality of life. So where do protons fit into this? This is just one of the many ways that you can deliver ablative doses to these areas. The primary benefits of proton therapy go back to the physics. First of all, a lot of the folks that we treat have been heavily pretreated, including things that can be bone marrow ablative. And you know that's one of the downsides of Plavicto, for example, right? Is it, while it's specific for prostate cancer, it also ends up in other structures that like all these things do, bone marrow, liver, et cetera. So if you've got poor marrow reserves and you go around treating more marrow to radiate these oligometastatic sites, that doesn't help. Many of these patients have had prior radiation to these sites and they're progressing again. So we have a greater safety margin of giving additional treatment, again, because of our, our superior physics. That's what, you know, the cancer cells could care less what you're hitting them with. They don't know if, oh, I'm being treated at a proton center versus getting x-rays. It's what do you do or not do to the surrounding tissue that makes the biggest difference. So this is a fairly typical uh, oligometastatic treatment. This is a patient I treated a couple months ago, solitary rib metastasis. That's what you see here in the, you know, on the right-hand side of the image. And I just used, uh, this was a two-field proton plan to give 30 gray, I think, in five fractions to the rib met and spare the vast majority of the normal lung and all the other surrounding tissue. So it's a real quick treatment. 
The toxicity is effectively nil. I think the most significant toxicity short term is that the patients do get a bit of a, a skin reaction that occurs a week or two after they finish, and that's it. And this is a case I'm currently treating in the Parton Center. He's under treatment right now. It's a gentleman uh, heavily pretreated, prostate cancer, initially had uh, prostatectomy, local failure in the pellet prostate bed, had postoperative radiotherapy in the bed with protons, actually. Now started failing metastatically. He um, has un undergone all sorts of systemic treatments, including Pluvicto, which was kind of marginally su moderately successful, but unfortunately did a really you know, good job of horribly uh, affecting his renal function. His glomerular filtration rate is really poor. And he now has oligometastatic disease in a couple areas. This is an area, a, this is the T6 vertebral body uh, it, that there is disease in. So the challenge here is how do you get an ablative dose into that and spare this thing right next to it, which is called the spinal cord. <laughs> so we're able to create a plan with a hole in it. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is another five fraction plan with protons using, I think, four beams where I'm giving uh, 35, 40 grade to the metastasis in five fractions, very nice ablative dose. And I'm not exceeding spinal cord tolerance because I'm able to shape the beams and stop the particles before they get to the cord. Uh, and this is the same patient now. We're looking at uh, his most recent uh, PSMA PET shows a periodic lymph node with this, you know, little slightly brighter spot is here. And you can see it outlined on my on the CT plan where I fuse the two together. It's this area outlined in, you know, in red that may not stand out too well. But that's what I'm doing to it. Again, we're treating this area at a high dose and we're not treating that's all that stuff you see in front of it, which is intestine. And we're not treating that thing behind it, which is a lumbar vertebral body. So we're able to treat these areas effectively with a lower probability of harm than you would get if you were treating this with X, you know, with the stereotactic x-rays, where you'd have dose coming in the back and the front and dose coming out the front and the back. So the conclusions on all this, you know, first of all, I think it's fair to say that particle therapy is no longer some boutique treatment that is only available in one place or two places in the world. We've got all these different manufacturers that are making the machines, including companies like Hitachi. And as a consequence, the machines are becoming less expensive. This is analogous to what happened in radiotherapy in the early 60s when cobalt 60 was introduced and what's happening with what happened with IMRT. We are still using or developing the ability to use our commonly our common planning tools that are used all the time in x-ray therapy, but that's really no longer much of an issue. And ultimately, we want to get to the point that the cost to the person who's writing the check for this treatment is similar to the cost of x-ray therapy. And we're actually almost there. That's what part makes the biggest difference in terms of acceptance. When this, this stuff costs more, insurers don't want to pay for it unless you can show them, you know, oh, some really good reason. When it costs the same, they don't care what you do. They'll tell you, do whatever you think is best medically. We're going to write the same check, you know, anyway, so you can you can do what you see fit. So in terms of the published data, it, what it shows is what, what you don't, you know, not too surprisingly, we are, we're less toxic. We're suppressing less bone marrow. We're having less effect on the, on the bowels and the bladder. Um, I didn't mention it, but there are papers showing that we're not suppressing testosterone to radiate the prostate, which is something that happens with IMRT. You heard about second cancer risk. I think it's important to realize that higher doses with whatever modality that you have available are important because they not only help control the local disease, they can also help reduce the risk of disease showing up elsewhere in the body. That should be it. That's just going by Mount Shasta several months ago. So I will stop the screen share and we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, for questions if there are any. Thanks. I'm sure there are some questions, Dr. Rossi, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation. I know it's uh, going to be very beneficial to uh, our community. Um, I want to just mention my case briefly, um, which is that you know we met last week. I went through the entire mapping process using CT plus MRI um, and did the overlay with Dr. Rossi. In the past. And I, and I, and, and I, uh, I had previously seen salvage radiation and I had a, a little bit of a nasty lesion that was intermeshed with my bladder wall and compressing my ureter. Um, the point is, is that after we looked at the imaging, Dr. Rossi felt that I actually was not a good candidate. So I, I mentioned that because 
you know, using this advanced imaging um, helps to uh, avoid toxicity, helps to avoid damage. And as patients who've gone through multiple treatments, ruling treatments out is just as valuable as ruling treatments in. And so I want to thank him for, you know, his, uh, his judgment on that. I, I trust him completely. Thank you, Brian. That's a really good point that sometimes, um, you know, the best thing to do is to not do something or, or, or not to, to intervene that the situation was such that, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't an issue whether I could technically get dose in. I certainly could. It's, is it helpful? And is it, you know, benefit risk? And that's a, you know, that's a physician judgment call. Thankfully, it's not something that AI is spitting out and saying yes or no yet. But having all these tools lets you make those judgment calls with a greater degree of certainty, or at least, you know, you feel, you, you feel better about what you're, about the, the recommendation you make, because you have been able to do the analysis that can help to shed some light on, you know, what are the pros and what are the cons of this potential treatment? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we uh, have a couple of hands up. Uh, I'll start off with uh, Amit, and then I think we got Carrie after that. Thanks, Fran. Uh, very informative presentation, Dr. Rossi. I kept coming up with questions to ask, and you kept answering them before I could ask. So <laughs> it, was, it was a very good presentation. Um, I, I am one of those who has gone through quite a few radiation treatments, actually, um, and not to the prostate, but uh, uh, to lumbar spine, thoracic spine, skull base. And I have seen a lot of uh, bone marrow suppression uh, because of that. Um, I was kind of curious, uh, you know, you, you talked about toxicity to bone marrow and difference between, and, and I, I went through VMAT mostly, like, uh, like you uh, mm -hmm. uh, said. Is there a quantitative data on toxicity? A difference between VMAT versus proton therapy. I mean, you say that obviously proton therapy is, you know, significantly better, but I kind of wonder if there's a quantitative data and information on that. I'd say semi-quantitative. You can outline the marrow space and you can use that to decide, well, look, how much radiation am I giving to the marrow space with one technology versus another? But that doesn't always directly correlate to the amount of bone marrow suppression that you create. So it's um, seen, it, part of it has to do with the, with you may have, a, you may outline what looks like marrow space, but it may not contain a lot of functional marrow for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you know, marrow gets replaced by fat, marrow stores change as we get older and stuff. So it's more of a, you know, an assumption, well, in the adults, at least a bit of an assumption, although there have been a couple of recent papers that have looked at this and compared, say, uh, doing what we call cranial spinal radiation, where you're treating the entire brain and spinal column in adults, which we do for in certain metastatic cases. Uh, there was actually a randomized trial at Memorial Sloan Kettering between doing this in breast cancer patients with metastasis to their cranial spinal axis, randomizing between protons and x-rays. And they found a very, this came out in the last couple of months, they found a very, very significant difference in the, not only the ability of patients to tolerate that treatment when the, favoring the proton arm, but also a difference in disease-free survival because of it. And then we do it all the time in kids uh, because a lot of the kids that we treat are also getting multi-agent chemotherapy. So if we're treating their neuraxis, we stop the beam before it goes into the vertebral body and we're able to get the kids through the chemotherapy because the marrow is not being ablated. So it's, you know, it's, it's semi-quantitative that, that you, you really look at the situation. If you're treating, you know, for example, a, a, a vertebral body in the cervical spine alone, they usually don't contain a lot of marrow anyway. If you, if you look at where an adult's bone marrow stores are, the 25% is in the pelvis, but another 25% is in the lumbar spine. And then you've got uh, the remainder being primarily in ribs, skull, and to a lesser extent, the thoracic vertebral body. So if I'm seeing a patient where I have to irradiate, you know, lumbar spine, yeah, it could be a big difference. If I'm seeing one where it's treating the C spine, I don't think you're going to see any. You're going to spare yeah. some zero, but you're not going to see any clinical difference. That. Yeah, no, I went through pelvic and lumbar spine radiation as well. So, um, anyways, uh, just a follow up question. You talked about uh, uh, you know risk of secondary uh, cancers. Uh, obviously, you know, we avoided all my kind of soft tissue and, uh, uh, you know, 
organs and stuff uh, in in the in the radiation treatment. But I have developed a new endocrine component to uh, in addition to adenocarcinoma that mm -hmm. I had. Have you seen that secondary cancer that you talked about being new endocrine? I have, and it's certainly something people have talked about in the literature. Um, the usual second cancers from radiotherapy, whether it's protons or x-rays, if you're treating the pelvis, you worry about leukemia because of bone marrow exposure. That's, that's more of an issue with x-rays, of course. And you worry about solid tumors, uh, rectum, bladder, and soft tissue sarcomas. So uh, whether or not the neuroendocrine component is because of the prior radiotherapy, the prostate cancer or re represents an evolution or a devolution of the prostate cancer is, is a, a subject, you know, there, there's a fair amount of controversy. I'd say that the majority of opinion is that this is just a change. It's not a radiation induced change in the malignancy. It's, hap it's something that happens as the malignancy continues to grow and you get more and more variation in the type of cells that are being cranked out. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Amit. Uh, Carrie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I hope my bandwidth will hold. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Rossi. Um, I have two sets of questions. One of them is um, about, 10, about 10 years ago at patient conferences, I remember folks were mixed about proton therapy. There was evidence of high cost and a lack of evidence, evidence of superiority. So I was curious whether the efficacy, if there's something about the technology that's improved or if it's just you have more data now. And then my second set of questions is also from the patient perspective when you're looking at making treatment decisions. We know, for instance, that MR-guided radiotherapy, i.e. the Meridian system, is different from CT-guided, which probably your IMRT studies are focused on. So can you talk about, are there any head-to-head -head studies, whether controlled or observational, that pit proton therapy against MRI-guided radiotherapy? in terms of especially probably greater access right now for patients to, to that system than Proton. So if, if you don't mind handling both of those sure. questions, sorry for yeah, the complexity. Sure. So first, let's, first one was talking about, mentioned about a decade ago, there were concerns over the cost and that there was limited evidence on efficacy or superiority. Happy to, to talk about, happy to answer all this stuff. So, you know, first of all, realize that when you talk about cost of treatment, that's not a medical issue per se. That is a contracting issue. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, a couple examples. First of all, we have contracts here at our facility with insurers where the cost of doing a course of proton therapy for prostate cancer is no different than the cost of doing x-ray therapy. That's a contractual agreement that you make. So you can do this with you know, a, lots, a lot of different sites. It's not because, well, the, 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 the technology is inherently more costly. It's, it has more to do with the business practices that you're able to establish. Um, there are some sites where it's actually cost less to treat with protons because you can treat in a faster manner. And the cost of radiotherapy is also determined by the cost, the number of, of fractions that you give. So when I've, you know, the discussions of cost, when people talk about the high cost of proton therapy, um, there are some people who haven't, they don't have any idea what they're act, what, what they're get, what the charges are for the treatment that they're delivering. I've had uh, people tell me about the high cost of protons. And when I tell them, do you realize that if you do IMRT, which is the standard, right? That to Medicare, IMRT is 270% more expensive than 3D conformal, which it is. And that there were never, were never a prospective randomized trials showing that IMRT was more efficacious than 3D conformal, but it cost 270% more. And they're like, really? Yeah, that, that's the truth. There were no randomized trials and it cost more, but we did it because of the physics. And that's the same reason, you know, why we look at proton therapy in terms of efficacy superiority. It's look, we, we, we've been on this road in radiotherapy for hundred years that every time you improve your technology and get more specific with where you treat, it's beneficial to the patient using whatever technology you have. So to say, well, we, we have a lack of efficacy. Well, you know, again, where's your efficacy for your the existing technology? You did that, you put in IMRT, you put in VMAT because the physics was better than its predecessor, not because you did all these randomized phase three trials to show that giving higher, that confining higher dose to a smaller area is better to the patient. There's a, a great lecture by Herman Suit back about 20 plus years ago that, that talked about all of this. 
Um, and of course, as the machines become more, uh, more manufactured, cost is dropped. You, you, a a one-room proton facility right now runs around $10 million, not cheap. But if you look at a modern X-ray therapy center, especially if you're talking about using MR-guided machinery, the cost is getting to be pretty close. And those machines aren't nearly as long lasting. You know, proton cyclotrons and synchrotrons last 25, 30, 40 years. Your typical LINAC has to be refurbished every three to five years. And that's often a, a multi-million dollar process. Um, so your second question was about whether or not we have any head-to-head -head trials yet of MR guided LINACs versus proton therapy. The answer is no. Uh, and there's actually very limited data on MR guided versus CT guided radiotherapy. There's the one trial that the UCLA uh, paper that came out a couple months ago, um, which, you know, first of all, it's physician reported toxicity, which all of us physicians realize that, you know, we, we tend to underestimate our toxicity. That's just the reality. That's why I tried to do patient reported quality of life. But the other thing in that study uh, was that the mar they said, well, we we're able to use tighter margins because we used MR guidance. Well, you can use tighter margins with uh, CT guidance, especially with fiducials. So whether that's showing that the MR is giving you a superiority in terms of toxicity because you're using MR guidance or because they, they cut the margin from four to two millimeters is, you know, that question is up in the air. There are certainly advantages to MR guidance. And to me, the advantage of doing it isn't so much that you're seeing the soft tissue, it's that you're eliminating yet another source of ionizing radiation exposure to the patient, which don't want to do. And it's not, not, a, you know, not a coincidence that MR-guided proton therapy is also under development. The issue with doing it in the proton world is that it's going to be a lot, te be a technologically much more difficult because we've got magnets galore in our treatment rooms. You know, we, we're doing all of our beam scan, beam shaping electromagnetically with these big, I almost said big ass, I just did, big ass magnets. And if you have an MR in there for imaging, and people have done you know, papers on this, you can start moving that little spot that you're using to paint with, it gets distorted because of these extraneous magnetic fields. So we want to develop it and it will, we will develop it. But again, I think the primary advantage is not because it lets you get a tighter margin or do something else. It's because it eliminates yet another potential source of toxicity, namely ionizing radiation for imaging. Well, I'm a fan of all those principles. Thanks so much. Sure. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Jonathan, I think you're up next. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Brian, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rossi, for that nice, those very informative talk. Um, my question, what the question is ultimately, um, is for salvage treatment of the prostate bed after a recurrence, after, say, prostatectomy, mm -hmm. um, does uh, proton beam radiation do less damage to the pelvis, well, to the bone marrow? Uh, than IMRT. And uh, although it's too late to benefit me, uh, what happened in my own personal case is I had recurrence right after prostatectomy and I did get IMRT to my prostate bed and uh, um, you know pelvic full pelvic uh, IMRT. And I had substantial uh, reduction in um, my white blood cell counts. Uh, especially lymphocytes. They went down to like, you know, like a third of the bottom of the standard range. Now, after a number of years, uh, so some of those, you know, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, some of the, they've recovered to the normal range after, you know, like five years. Uh, but I just wonder sometimes what would have happened if I had known about, uh, I, um, prostate beam, I mean, a uh, proton beam treatment. And I wonder what to tell, you know, other people in support groups about it in regards to uh, full pelvic salvage radiation. Sure. Yeah. Um, a general rule when you're looking at comparing a proton plan of anything to an x-ray plan of anything is that the larger the field and the more irregular the shape, the greater the advantage is going to be to use protons versus x-rays because if you're covering an area like the whole pelvis, you know, when you're covering the lymph nodes, which are along the blood vessels, that's a big field to treat with x-rays. And even though you can concentrate 
very beautifully on the, on the lymph nodes and prostate bed, yes, you have a dose bath. And that dose bath is primarily going to be to the iliac wings, which is where you have a of your pelvic marrow. So if you treat that patient with protons, rather than having a dose bath to the iliac wings, the way you treat the pelvic lymph nodes is you bring in a single posterior field, which effectively is in the shape of a U, because that's the way the lymph nodes are distributed. So you stay away from the iliac wings and the iliac wing radiation dose is zero. So you're sparing bone marrow and the iliac wings. The other thing that you're sparing, other two things you're sparing are intestine because that's anterior and that's in the, the center of the U where the dose is zero. And um, you're sparing the majority of the bladder because you're able to put the, again, you're treating with a, a direction where the majority of the bladder is not receiving any radiation. So that's where you'd see the differences, bone marrow exposure and exposure of bowel and bladder to radiotherapy. There would be no difference in the dose to the bed. In fact, you wanna make sure you treat that anastomosis. That'd be the same with protons or x-rays. So no difference there whatsoever, but you can do a very nice job of sparing normal bone marrow and normal intestine and normal bladder. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna do a time check here. We've got about three more minutes. Dr. Rossi, we've got a couple other folks okay. that have their hands up. Can you stay a little bit longer? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay. I'm not banging on the door yet, so that's good. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. I appreciate that. Uh, Jonathan, did you, did you have a follow-up or are you good? Uh, that's enough for me. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank, and you. thank you for that. Sure, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rossi. I know uh, that Jeff has a question. I'll be very quick. I just wonder, is proton beam therapy being used at all for um, uh, in uh, radiation intense uh, conditioning for bone marrow transplants? It's sort of the opposite problem in a way, but just wondered if, if people- Yeah, um, we've talked about it, but we haven't done it. Um, partly it has to do with the field size. So if you're going to do a condition a patient for a bone marrow transplant, you normally have to treat whole body. Uh, because you got to blade all the marrow. And while you can do that, I mean, with the, with the scanning beam, it would take a while. So we, it ha, it's, it's been something people have theorized, but as far as I know, it has never been done in reality. I guess maybe you could do it on sensitive areas, stay away from the eyeballs for your heart or something. Yeah. The, 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 the idea is that you can, you can do it and spare a lot of healthy tissue. If you look at the toxicity from whole, from whole body uh, radiotherapy, that you're doing for prep for a transplant, the lungs are a big issue. Yeah. So theoretically, you could treat the rib, you got to treat the ribs and you got to treat the, the thoracic spine and you can stop the beam before it hits the, the lung. Although uh, protons, they stop in lung, but because lung is so low density, they don't stop nearly as rapidly as they do in soft tissue. So uh, yeah, you know, we, we've had some patients that have needed uh, whole body uh, you know, prep for bone marrow transplant. We've usually gone from here up to City of Hope because that's one of the few places that's still set up to do it. Yeah, really for young women, I think the biggest case, and I have a personal experience with this, is for, uh, you know, reproductive organs. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, we, yeah, right. And this is also an issue if we're, when we're, you know, why do we use protons so much in pediatrics? Uh, a lot of the stuff we treat in kids are central nervous system tumors where you're treating the whole neuraxis, that whole brain and spinal cord, and you're sparing the, oh, you know, you stop the beam so it never hits the ovaries or it never hits the testicles. And that's why we at, you know, at any one given time, probably 15, 20 percent of the patients we're treating here, just through most proton centers, are kids. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. Hi, Dr. Rossi. Um, I had a question. Um, uh, a few years back, um, uh, my oncologist uh, had recommended um, consolidation. I'm in the oligometric uh, uh, category. Um, and uh, we did this at, uh, with Dr. Tran, who was then at um, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, through um, IMRT and uh, a longer uh, session of those, and then a very short session of um, stereotactic for uh, a uh, pelvic lesion. Um, and during that time, uh, I was encouraged to uh, be on a, a, a ketogenic diet. Um, and I'm just, uh, and my experience was, uh, although that didn't uh, uh, put my prostate cancer into remission, 
Um, I didn't seem to have any uh, noticeable side effects from uh, the treatment. And I'm just wondering uh, if you're familiar with any research about um, uh, either diet or uh, other things uh, that can be done to kind of mitigate uh, possible radiation side effects from that kind of treatment. Yeah, um, so my short answer is very, I, I, my, my familiarity with this is pretty minimal. I um, the, the question that more you typically comes up, is there a diet that can help with my prognosis? And that's where I, I get back to Mark Moyad's, you know, if it's felt good for your heart, it's probably good for your prostate. There certainly are things you can do from a dietary standpoint, especially if you're getting x-ray therapy to the pelvis that can minimize toxicity because what you're, it has to do with effects on intestine primarily. So if patients are eating a diet where they're going to have um, you know, it, you know, anything which would normally make the stools loose, right? So roughage, whatever, it's gonna be that much worse if you are getting radiotherapy to the pelvis. So we often have them change to a diet during, if you're giving pelvic x-ray therapy, that is less likely to cause diarrhea. It's, you know, it's the, the brat diet, whatever you want to call it, want to call it. But I'm not, I don't know if the specifics of a ketogenic diet would make that much of a difference in what I do. You know, we rarely see you know, any GI toxicity at all during this because you just you're, the radiation dose of the intestine is zero, so you're not worried about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Dr. Morris. Hi, I just wanted to um, uh, thank Dr. Rossity for the informative talk. And, but more importantly, I wanted to thank him for being my doctor. Um, you may not remember me, Dr. Rossi, um, but in 2020, June 2020, you treated me for oligometastatic uh, prostate cancer to three uh, bone mets. And I really appreciate you taking me on, especially since uh, pilarifer was not even approved at that point. I, I was actually in the study uh, at UCSF and uh, I actually it was Stanford that um, actually got both, believe it or not, I got both the gallium scan and uh, the pilarifer yeah. scan and they were actually discordant. The, the gallium scan showed that I did not have metastatic disease and pilarifer said I did. And I, I ran in there when I got to point two because that was the cut point for both those studies. I'm sorry for being so long-winded. I just wanted to thank Dr. Rossi for being my doctor. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. awesome. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Abit, I think you've got a follow-up question. 